A very good evening aspirants. I welcome you all to the Hindu daily news analysis brought to you by Shankar AS Academy. Today I am going to cover important news articles from the Hindu newspaper dated 13th of July 2023. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we will be discussing today. At the end of the video we will also have prelims practice question discussions. So try to watch the entire video. And a kind request to you all those who have not yet subscribed our YouTube channel do subscribe and hit the bell icon button so that you will get regular notifications about our current affairs videos. Now let us get into our first news article discussion. Now take a look at this article from the editorial page. Recently on 29th June the foreign ministers of India and the Philippines met in New Delhi. The ministers met under the context of the fifth meeting of Philippines India Joint Commission on Bilateral Cooperation. The meeting mainly focused on strengthening the bilateral cooperation between India and the Philippines. See various decisions were made during the meeting. The first is the decision to open the resident defense attach office in Manila. The second is the decision to boost cooperation between coast guards of the two countries. Thirdly, India agreed to provide the Philippines with maritime vessels at a consensual line of credit. Fourthly, both countries agreed to conduct joint exercises on maritime security and disaster responses. Then they also agreed to conduct maritime dialogue for nautical partnership. And lastly, in a significant move, both countries agreed to resolve regional and multilateral issues particularly on maritime highways such as the South China Sea. In this, India stated two things. The first one is that all countries must adhere to the international law including United Nations conventional law on oceans and seas. This has been the consistent position of India. Then secondly India stated that countries must adhere to the 2016 arbitral award on the South China Sea. See this position of India is a deviation from its normal stance. Up until now India's position regarding the 2016 arbitral award on the South China Sea was ambiguous and not very clear. But right now India has expressed its opinion clearly. So the editorial here is written in this context only. That is change in India's position regarding the 2016 arbitral award on the South China Sea. The author of the editorial covers the 2016 award of the permanent code of arbitration and the steps that can be taken to resolve the South China Sea issue. Okay, And this is the overall essence of the editorial. Now to understand this editorial better in our discussion today, let us see about the location of South China Sea, the strategic importance of South China Sea, then the claims made by the countries and finally we will see about the points mentioned in this editorial. This is the plan. Now before starting the discussion, just go through the syllabus relevant to this topic. Now let's start our discussion by looking at the location of South China Sea. See this map here. This is the location of South China Sea. The South China Sea is a marginal sea of the Western Pacific Ocean. And you can see that it is bordered by China, Taiwan, the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei and Vietnam. The South China Sea is connected to the East China Sea through the Taiwan Strait or Formosa Strait. Then it is connected to Philippine Sea in the east by Luzon Strait. Then the South China Sea is connected with the Sulu Sea in the southeast by Mindoro and Balbac Straits. Then it is connected to the Java Sea in the south by Karimata Strait and Banka Strait. Okay, This is all about the location of South China Sea. Now we will see the location of different islands present in the South China Sea. Now look at this map here. This is the parcel island. See this archipelago is a collection of 130 islands and coral reefs. You can also notice that this almost equidistance from both China and Vietnam. Then this is the Spartly Island. It is a large group of reefs, shoals, atolls and small islets in the South China Sea. They are located north of Malaysia and you can see that it is roughly midway between Vietnam and the Philippines. Then this is Scarborough Shoal which is another important island in the South China Sea region. And this is the Natuna Archipelago. This is also another important island in the South China Sea. Also note that all these islands are largely 
uninhabited. Now the problem here is that these islands are wholly or partly claimed by several countries in the region. As you see in this map, the red line marks China's claim, which China also calls the nine dash line. Then this yellow line marks Vietnam's claim. Then this blue line marks Philippines claim and other players also have their own interest in the region. For instance, the Spartley Island is disputed between China, Taiwan, Vietnam, Philippines and Malaysia. Then the Parcel Island is disputed between China, Taiwan and Vietnam. And this Scarborough Shoal is disputed between China, Taiwan and Philippines. See here, nine dash line is a vaguely defined line used by China for climbing a major part of the South China Sea. Through its consumption of this nine dash line, China tries to claim exclusive rights on marine resources of the South China Sea region. Okay, now why is China and the other countries interested in the region? See, there are two major reasons for this. That is the resources and trade. Firstly, these countries believe that there could be oil resources in these islands. This is because in the 1970s, oil was discovered in some of these islands, specifically off the coast of Palawan. Secondly, the South China Sea is an important trade route. As you see in this map, it connects the Indian Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. It is considered to be one of the most busiest waterways in the world. And it is a significant gateway for trade and merchant shipping. So this is another reason why the countries tries to own a large space here. China to be specific wants control over the South China Sea so that it can safeguard its trade routes then ensure the safety of its commercial vehicles and it will protect its economic interests. Apart from these reasons, the South China Sea is also an important fishing ground and it is an essential source of food for many people in the region. And this is why South China Sea has become strategically important. Now moving forward, let us see some points about the 2016 Arbitral Award on the South China Sea. See, in Jan 2013, the Philippines initiated arbitration against China in the Permanent Court of Arbitration. Now, what is this Permanent Court of Arbitration? The Permanent Court of Arbitration is an intergovernmental organization established by a treaty in 1899. Its main objective is to provide dispute resolution services to the international community. Note that the Permanent Court of Arbitration was the first permanent intergovernmental organization to provide a forum for the resolution of international disputes through arbitration and other peaceful means. Note that the Permanent Court of Arbitration is not a court, but rather than an organizer of arbitral tribunals. By organizing arbitral tribunals, the Permanent Court of Arbitration tries to resolve conflicts between member states, international organizations or private parties. And note that the headquarters of the Permanent Court of Arbitration is at the Peace Palace in The Hague, the Netherlands. The parties to the Convention on the Pacific Settlement of Disputes of 1899 and 1907 are automatically parties to the Permanent Court of Arbitration. Right now, the Permanent Court of Arbitration has 122 contracting parties and India is also a contracting party to the Permanent Court of Arbitration. Note that the Permanent Court of Arbitration is not a UN agency, but it is an official UN observer. A note important point here, all decisions called awards are binding on all the parties in the dispute and they have to be carried out without any delay. Okay, this is all about the Permanent Court of Arbitration. Now coming back to the South China Sea issue, after the Philippines initiated arbitration at the Permanent Court of Arbitration, China immediately rejected it and it said that it will neither accept nor participate in the arbitration. Furthermore, in 2014, China again stated that the Permanent Court of Arbitration Tribunal does not have jurisdiction over the South China Sea case. For this statement, the Permanent Court of Arbitration quoted UN Clause Annex 7. According to the Annex 7 of the UN clause, proceeding against a party or country can go ahead when the party is absent or when the party fails to present itself. So, as per this Annex 7, the Permanent Court of Arbitration went ahead and gave the Arbitral Award in 2016. Now, let us see some points about the award given by Permanent Court of Arbitration. Firstly, the Permanent Court of Arbitration denied 
the historical rights claimed by China in the South China Sea. Secondly, the Permanent Court of Arbitration denied China's claim to resources within the Nine Dash Line in the South China Sea. Thirdly, the Permanent Court of Arbitration said that China, by land reclamation, had fundamentally changed the reefs in contravention of UN Clause commitments. Basically, China has destroyed natural evidence. Finally, the Permanent Court of Arbitration also mentioned that China had reduced the traditional fishing rights of Filipino fishermen and it is also interfering with Philippines fishing and petroleum exploration. Overall, the Permanent Court of Arbitration in its awards emphasized that the issue here is the difference in interpretations of separate rights under UN clause in the South China Sea. Okay, as we already saw, the award of the Permanent Court of Arbitration is final and binding. But still China claims the award as unlawful and it is still reiterating its claims in the South China Sea. This is a major issue because this assertive nature of China might result in military confrontation in the South China Sea. But due to South China Sea's geopolitics, economy and strategic importance, a peace in the region is not only important for the countries in the South China Sea region but also for the whole world. See, even after the Permanent Court of Arbitration Award that was given in 2016, the reality on the ground has not altered. This shows that the Permanent Court of Arbitration's decisions cannot be implemented in reality due to the overwhelming presence of China in the region. So, the author of the editorial says that the leaders of Association of Southeast Asian Nations, that is the Asian, must find a compromise among themselves before confronting China. So, how can a compromise can be achieved among the Asian countries? The solution is quiet diplomacy. Here, what is quiet diplomacy? Quiet diplomacy refers to the diplomatic efforts and negotiations conducted privately and confidentially away from the public eye and media attention. It is also known as discrete diplomacy or behind the scenes diplomacy. The main characteristics of quiet diplomacy is that it emphasizes on confidentiality and privacy. It allows parties involved in a dispute or negotiation to have frank and open discussions without the pressure of public scrutiny. By keeping the discussions confidential, diplomats can explore creative solutions, then make compromises and build trust in a more flexible environment. So, through quiet diplomacy, the Asian members must create a political framework and progress towards a legally binding code of conduct. And this send the necessary political pressure on China to adhere to 2016 Arbitral Award on South China Sea. Okay, and that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the location of South China Sea. Then we saw about the location of various islands present on the South China Sea. Then we saw about the strategic importance of South China Sea. Then we saw about various countries' claims on South China Sea. Then we saw about the 2016 Arbitral Award of Permanent Court of Arbitration. Then we saw about China's stand on Arbitral Award. And finally, we saw some points about how to resolve the issue using quiet diplomacy. See, this topic is very much important for your both prelims and mains. So, make note of each and every points that we discussed. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now, take a look at this news article. Recently, a Nilgiri Thar attacked and injured two forest watchers in Idaki. So, the forest department of Kerala is planning to capture and translocate such Nilgiri Thar to the Ervikulam National Park. And note that the Ervikulam National Park is famous for protecting the indigenous population of Nilgiri Thar. And this is all about the news. Now, in this context, let us see few points about Nilgiri Thar. See, Nilgiri Thar is also known as Nilgiri Ibex. It is a mountain ungulate species. Here, ungulate is the term applied to any hoofed mammal. Hoof is nothing but the hard covering present on the bottom of the feet of animals such as horses, sheep, deer, etc. The hoof usually protects the toes of such animals. See, in India, we have around 12 mountain ungulate species. But Nilgiri Thar is the only mountain ungulate seen in southern India. A note on important point here, Nilgiri Thar is an endemic species of western Ghats. Now coming to the distribution of Nilgiri Thar, previously the Nilgiri Thar was found along the entire stretch of western Ghats. 
but now it is found only in small fragmented pockets of western guards currently the nilgiri thar is distributed along a narrow stretch of 400 km in the western guards this stretch is between the nilgiris in the north and kanyakumari hills in the south of the region the stretch falls in the states of kerala and tamil nadu see a large part of nilgiri thar population has been wiped out from its historical range even the existing populations are under severe stress due to many threats according to the survey a smaller populations of nilgiri thar are also found in palani hills shrivilliputtur range the megamalai and agastya ranges but only two large populations are documented so far one is present in the nilgiris and the other is from the anaimalai hills in kerala here note that the arvikulam national park in anaimalai hills is the home to the largest population of the nilgiri thar the arvikulam national park has more than 700 individuals of nilgiri thar okay now let us see some of its characteristic features see the preferred habitat of nilgiri thar is grasslands with steep rocky cliff shelters so the nilgiri thar is found in the open mountain grassland habitats of southern western ghats at elevations from 1200 to 2600 meter and note that nilgiri thar is the only thar adapted to a cold and wet tropical environment a note on important point here nilgiri thar is diurnal that is the nilgiri thar is active in the day time okay now moving on to see about the threats faced by nilgiri thar the most important threat is the habitat loss caused by deforestation apart from this the hydroelectric projects in their habitat also endangers the nilgiri thar severely then the activities like monoculture plantations in western ghats affect their survival because these monoculture plantations destroy the grasslands on which nilgiri thar feeds apart from this the nilgiri thar have competition with domestic livestock in search of food also the nilgiri thar are hunted for their meat and skin and this drastically reduced their population over the years okay this is all about the threats now finally we'll see about the conservation status of nilgiri thar see as a result of deforestation and habitat fragmentation the nilgiri thar is classified as endangered species in the iucn red list of threatened species and they are protected under schedule 1 of the wildlife protection act 1972 and note one interesting fact here nilgiri thar is the state animal of tamil nadu okay and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about nilgiri thar then about its distribution then we saw about the characteristic features of nilgiri thar then we moved on to see about the threats faced by nilgiri thar and finally we saw some points about the conservation status of nilgiri thar see this topic is very much important for your prelims exam so make note of each and every points that we discussed now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion now take a look at this news article from the text and context page see recently the union cabinet has approved the introduction of the national research foundation bill in the parliament now in this context let us learn about the national research foundation and its role in funding science and technology research in india now first let's understand the background of the national research foundation see the national research foundation which is in short called nrf has been introduced by the government as part of the national education policy 2020 the idea behind the introduction of nrf is to address the need for a coordinating agency see the nrf can bring together researchers government bodies and various industries so with the help of nrf we can promote research and development in the country so the main goal of the nrf is to facilitate research in india's universities particularly the state universities so for the research purposes the grants will be provided by the national research foundation also funds for research infrastructure will be allocated and supporting researchers will be made available okay now let's talk about the funding of national research foundation the national research foundation will operate with a budget of rupees 50000 crore over 5 years out of this 28 percentage that is rupees 14000 crore will be contributed by the government the remaining 72 percentage that is rupees 36000 crore will come from the private sector 
However, the government share is expected to increase gradually. It may reach rupees 20,000 crore per year. Besides this, to fund the NRF, 4,000 crore will be allocated from the existing budget of the Science and Engineering Research Board. See, the Science and Engineering Research Board will be integrated into National Research Foundation. So, the budget of Science and Engineering Research Board will go into NRF. However, some concerns have been raised about the funding allocated to the National Research Foundation. Now, let us see the concerns. See, the proposed budget is relatively small. It amounts to less than 2% of nation's gross domestic expenditure on research and development. When comparing India's GDP and research spending to other major economies, the gap appears significant. For instance, India's gross domestic expenditure on research and development in 2017-18 was Rs. 1,13,825 crore. This was nearly 25 times less than both the China and US during the same period. So, this highlights the need for greater investment in research and development to foster scientific progress and innovation in our country. The article says that the National Research Foundation can facilitate ease of doing science. But to ensure that the National Research Foundation effectively facilitates research, certain measures need to be implemented. Now, let us see what are the measures that need to be implemented for effective functioning of National Research Foundation. Firstly, there should be a minimal time for grant approval. That is, the time between applying for a research grant and receiving the funds should be minimal. Ideally, it shall be 6 months. See, the National Research Foundation draft mentions that peer review process should be completed within 6 months. But the release of funds may still face delays due to pending financial clearance. Secondly, there should be digital processing of paperwork. See, all paperwork related to research grants should be processed digitally. This will eliminate the need for hard copies. Also, it will streamline the administrative process and save time and resources for both the researchers and the National Research Foundation. Thirdly, all financial queries, paperwork and approval process should be conducted between the National Research Foundation and the Finance Department of the University or research institutions. This would allow scientists to focus primarily on their research and they don't have to take the administrative burdens. Fourthly, the National Research Foundation should establish an explicit spending guidelines specific to scientific research. These guidelines should provide flexibility in spending at the same time it should hold the scientists accountable for their use of funds. Finally, there should be timely disbursement of funds. See, the release of funds should be timely and efficient. The National Research Foundation draft mentions the timely disposal of funds. But a mechanism needs to be established and implemented to ensure that the funds reach researchers when needed. Besides all this, there is also another question that remains unanswered. See, the involvement of the private industry in the National Research Foundation is seen as a positive step. However, it remains unclear how the government plans to raise rupees 60,000 crore from the private sector. The National Research Foundation draft mentions a legislative route to facilitate private investment. But there should be a more detailed plan and mechanisms like escrow accounts to provide reassurance to the scientific community. Now, what is this escrow account? See, an escrow account is a financial arrangement where a neutral third party holds funds or assets on behalf of two parties involved in a transaction. The funds are released to the appropriate party once certain conditions are met. For example, when purchasing a house, the buyer may deposit the funds into an escrow account until all necessary paperwork and inspections are completed. Once satisfied, the funds are released to the seller. So, this will ensure a secure and transparent transaction. So, bringing in escrow accounts into the National Research Foundation will attract more investments from the private sector. Now finally, let's talk about National Research Foundation's model and implementation. See, the National Research Foundation takes inspiration from successful science agencies worldwide, including the National Science Foundation in the United States. The National Research Foundation has adopted best practices from agencies in Germany, the United Kingdom, Switzerland, Norway, South Korea and Singapore. 
द नेशनल रिसर्च फाउंडेशन ड्राफ्ट अक्नोलेजस् द इंपार्टन आफ क्रिटिकल थिंकिंग क्रियेटिविटी आंड इनोवेशन बट इट लैक्स क्लारटी आन हौ द फेशन विल ट्रांसपेरेंटली सीड फंड अंड कोआर्डेट रिसर्च अक्रॉस इंस्टिट्यूशन सो टू कंक्लूड The success of the National Research Foundation will depend on the government's ability to establish clear rules and effectively implementing the rules. Okay, and that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about what is National Research Foundation. Then we saw about the funding pattern of National Research Foundation. Then we saw about what are all the measures that needed to be implemented for effective implementation of research. And finally, we saw some points about the model and implementation of National Research Foundation. See this topic is very much important for your both prelims and mains so make note of each and every points that we discussed now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion now take a look at this news article it says that the national human rights commission has asked the odisha government to provide a report on balasore train accident earlier the national human rights commission has received various complaints which stated that the odisha state government and the indian railways didn't maintain the dignity of the dead people in train accident so based on this complaint only the national human rights commission has now asked the odisha government to provide a report on balasore train accident and this is all about the news article given here now in this discussion let us see some points about national human rights commission see the national human rights commission is an independent body that was established in 1993 under the protection of human rights act 1993 so we can say that the national human rights commission is a statutory body this is because it was established based on the act of parliament as the national human rights commission deals with the human rights it is called as the watchdog of human rights in india now talking about the composition the national human rights commission consists of a chairperson and four other full time members apart from this the national human rights commission has also several other ex officio members from various other commissions like national commission for scheduled caste national commission for scheduled tribes national commission for women and so on note that the chairman of commission shall be a retired chief justice of india or retired judge of the supreme court see all the members and chairman are appointed by the president based on the recommendations of six member selection committee The selection committee consists of prime minister who acts as the chairperson then speaker of lok sabha deputy chairman of rajya sabha leader of opposition in both houses of parliament and union home minister see the chairman and the members hold office for 3 years or until they attain the age of 70 years whichever is earlier now moving on to see about the functions and powers of national human rights commission See the National Human Rights Commission has all the powers of civil court. It can investigate into a matter either by suo moto or by receiving a petition. It has the power to interfere in any judicial proceedings that involves violation of human rights. And note that the National Human Rights Commission undertakes and promotes research in the field of human rights. See even though National Human Rights Commission is a statutory body, it has some limitations that restricts its powers. For example, the National Human Rights Commission can only look into a matter of human rights violation within one year of its occurrence. Also note that it cannot take actions when the violations are done by private parties. Apart from this, the National Human Rights Commission has no power to punish the violators and it also cannot grant any reliefs for victims. In addition to this, the functions of the commission are mainly recommendatory in nature. and the recommendations are not binding on the government so to conclude the effectiveness of the national human rights commission can be improved only if its reports and decisions are strictly enforced by the government okay and that's all about national human rights commission in this discussion we saw about national human rights commission then we saw about the composition of the national human rights commission and finally we saw some points about the functions and limitations of national human rights commission Now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion Now look at this news article here this news article is speaking about the recent flooding in the Yamuna river the water level of the Yamuna in Delhi has reached a 60 year high so the CM of Delhi has requested the central government to release less water from the Hathinikund barrage if possible to prevent further flooding along the banks of Yamuna 
and this is about the news article given here now in this context let us see some points about the river Yamuna now first let's see the course of the river the river Yamuna originates from the Yamunotri glacier on the Bandar Punch peak in the Gaharwal region in Uttarakhand at an elevation of about 6000 meters as you can see in this map along the Himalayas the river flows in a southerly direction due to the steepness of the Himalayas the river flows very rapidly along the Himalayas the river enters the Indo-Gangetic plain while it exits the state of Uttarakhand after that the river takes an easterly direction note one important point here the river Yamuna is the largest and the most important tributary of river Ganga along the way the Yamuna river passes through the states of Uttarakhand, Haryana, Delhi and Uttar Pradesh and the river finally merges with the Ganga river near Triveni Sangam in Allahabad this is all about the course of the river Yamuna now we will see the important tributaries of river Yamuna the tributaries of Yamuna account for 70.9 percentage of the catchment area the balance of 29.1 percentage area directly drains into the Yamuna river the river has both peninsular and non-peninsular tributaries its non-peninsular tributaries include Thorns and Hinden and its peninsular tributaries include Chambal, Sindh, Betua and Ken as we saw earlier river Yamuna flows through Uttarakhand, Haryana, Delhi and UP but due to its wide network of tributaries the Yamuna river system has catchment areas in the states of Uttarakhand, Haryana, Delhi Uttar Pradesh, Himachal Pradesh, Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh ok this is all about the catchment areas and the tributaries of river Yamuna now finally let us see some important dams and barrages along the river Yamuna see based on the location of various dams the Yamuna is segmented and given different names from the origin to the now decommissioned Tajaywala barrage it is called Himalayan segment Tajaywala barrage is located in Haryana and it is now replaced by Hathinikun barrage which is also located in Haryana between the Tajaywala barrage and the Vasirabad barrage it is called the upper segment of river Yamuna and note that Vasirabad barrage is located in North Delhi and between the Vasirabad barrage and the Okla barrage it is called the Delhi segment see the Okla barrage is part of the Okla bird sanctuary which is located in south of New Delhi see the Delhi segment has also another barrage which is ITO barrage or the Interprastha barrage and next is the eutrophicated segment this segment lies between the Okla barrage and the Chambal confluence and this is the longest segment and this segment has the Madura or Gokul barrage and this is the last major barrage in river Yamuna and the final segment of the river Yamuna is called the diluted segment and it lies between Chambal confluence and the Ganga confluence okay and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about the course of the river Yamuna then we saw about the important tributaries of river Yamuna and finally we saw some points about the dams or barrages that located along the course of river Yamuna see this topic is very much important for your prelims exam so make note of each and every points that we discussed now with these points in mind let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion that is to discuss preliminary practice questions now look at the first question here two statements are given we have to find which statement is correct now look at the first statement the chairman of the national human rights commission is appointed by the president as we saw in the discussion this is correct the chairman of the national human rights commission is appointed by the president based on the six member selection committee now look at the second statement the chairman of the state human rights commission is removed by the governor see this statement is incorrect although the chairperson and members of state human rights commission are appointed by the governor they can be removed only by the president so second statement is incorrect here first statement alone is correct so the correct answer is option a one only moving on look at the second question this is a pair based question on one side various barrages are given and on the other side the location is given you have to find how many of the pairs are correctly matched first pair Atnikun barrage Uttarakhand second pair Vasirabad barrage Haryana third pair Okla barrage New Delhi fourth pair Gokul barrage Uttar Pradesh as we saw in the discussion Atnikun barrage is located in Haryana and not in Uttarakhand then Vasirabad barrage is located in 
நார்த் டெல்லி அண்ட் நாட் இன் ஹரியானா சி த ரெஸ்ட் டூ பேர்ஸ் ஆர் கரெக்ட்லி மேட்ச்ட் த ஓக்லா பேரேஜ் இஸ் லொக்கேட் இன் நியூ டெல்லி அண்ட் த கோகுல் பேரேஜ் இஸ் லொக்கேட் இன் உத்தரப்பிரதேஷ் ஹியர் தேர்ட் அண்ட் ஃபோர்த் பேர் அலோன் ஆர் கரெக்ட்லி மேட்ச்ட் ஸோ த கரெக்ட் ஆன்சர் இஸ் ஆப்ஷன் பி ஒன்லி டூ This is the quiz question for you today. I will post this quiz question in your community section. Try to answer it. And don't worry, the answer for the quiz question is posted in the comment section of the quiz question itself. You can verify the answers. And displayed here are the main questions for your practice. Go through the questions, write your answers and post it in the comment section. With this, we have come to the end of the video. If you found our video to be useful, do like, comment and share it with your friends. And don't forget to subscribe to Shankar Ayas Academy YouTube channel. Now thank you for listening.